Our planet's climate is a highly complex, interlocked, self-organising system. It's been under nature's control for eons. Could we intervene and take over some of the control? Well, advocates of geoengineering believe we could. Geoengineering is the deliberate engineering of the climate to combat some of the effects of climate change. For example, one suggestion is to release a whole lot of sulphate particles into the sky. It's like fighting pollution with pollution. Just as carbon emissions warm things up on Earth, the sulphate particles should cool things down. It sounds completely crazy, but here in London, geoengineering has taken on a new credibility. Its ideas have been seriously investigated by no less than the Royal Society. The Royal Society is a collection of some of the world's top scientists. In fact, it's considered a real honour to become a member. The organisation has been going since 1660. This is its headquarters in London. And one of the geoengineering panel scientists, Professor Joe Haig, gave me the official tour. So, here we are in the old library of the Royal Society. Yeah, very it's impressive. Highly decorated, as you can see. Yeah. I think a lot of famous busts around the walls here. Who's this guy? That's right, this is John Flamsteed, who was the Astronomer Royal oh, yeah. around yeah. Uh, the year 1700. Yeah, and uh, more up the end here, who's oh, that's that? Michael Faraday. That's right, it's Michael Faraday, very famous for the work on electricity and magnetism. Yeah. But back to geoengineering. Why would the Royal Society get involved? The Royal Society has been involved much more in sort of policy angle over the last few years and it's been particularly interested in looking at climate and climate change. This is the famous report. That's right, this is geoengineering the climate that the uh, Royal Society commissioned. It's pretty controversial stuff, geoengineering. It is, but it's uh, risen up the political agenda to such an extent that I think it's uh, not sensible to try and pretend it doesn't exist. The thing to do is try and look at it objectively and see the pros and cons and have a, a scientific perspective on the whole thing. There's a whole host of ideas, from the very sci-fi, cooling the Earth by constructing giant sunshades in space, to adding iron to the oceans as fertiliser. Fertilising the oceans means putting certain nutrients in the sea to help algae grow. And just as when trees grow on land, when the algae grow, they suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, thus reducing our carbon emissions. That works. The trouble is that you might also be poisoning the oceans by putting in these extra things, and we need to think about what is the side effects of these mechanisms. Remarkably, one of the more serious ideas is putting sulphate particles into the sky. When big volcanoes erupt, they emit particles, and when it's a very big eruption, these particles sit in the stratosphere for um, months, if not years, and there has been measured cooling in response to volcanic eruptions. So the idea would be to essentially simulate those sort of volcanic eruptions by putting sulphate particles into the stratosphere and reflect the sun's radiation back to space. The particles could be released from airborne craft just as today, planes release silver iodide particles into clouds to try to seed rain. If cost were no object, it could be done, but there'd be a few consequences. It's almost certainly would destroy ozone, um, and we've seen ozone depletion in response to volcanic eruptions. And the world might be cooler, but what would happen to the weather? You don't get the whole of the climate back to where it was before, so there are large changes in the monsoon patterns, for example, and tropical rainfall and the whole of the hydrological cycle, which therefore, of course, affects the tropics in a very significant way. And you have to be very careful that you're not tweaking one part of the climate system without knowing what's happening to the rest. When you look into geoengineering, you get the feeling it's a road we don't really want to go down. You may do one of these interfering techniques, have missed one of the links or, or not taken proper account of some of the effects and put yourself into an even worse situation than you were before. <laughs> But in Switzerland, there's one geoengineering suggestion that's in a different category. Here, they're experimenting with taking out all the carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere. And one way you might do that is with giant mirrors. Like a child's magnifying glass, an enormous mirror focuses sunlight, creating tremendous heat. 
A flat mirror reflects the sunlight into this building and onto this parabolic mirror. We can reach maximum concentration of about 5,000 suns. And what we can do with this is reach very high temperatures up to 2,000 degrees. And those temperatures can be used to remove CO2 from the sky. All you need is some carbon dioxide absorbing powder. This is a very simple chemical compound, calcium oxide also known as quicklime. Now the thing is, when you heat it, it absorbs carbon dioxide just out of the ambient air, turning some of this substance into calcium carbonate, limestone. The carbon dioxide is safely stored in the limestone. Researchers from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology have built this laboratory demonstration of the process. Focal point is exactly matching. An artificial light fills in for the sun and air from the room is pumped through calcium oxide powder. The treated air is then measured. OK, so we should start to see the CO2 content drop. Yes, as soon as we have our temperature of 380 degrees Celsius. Oh, yeah? They're starting now? Yeah. Gee, it goes quickly. So we could take all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, cause another ice age? We could go below pre-industrial, you're right. <laughs> Cost means the limestone powder is only a temporary storage. The beauty of this reaction is, further heat this substance up past 800 degrees Celsius and it gives off its carbon dioxide, which can then be captured. The calcium oxide powder is recycled and the CO2 liquefied and perhaps stored underground. The cost of building these giant sun-focusing facilities that create enough heat to melt bricks is of course an issue. But the researchers have come up with a new version of their process that doesn't need these kinds of temperatures. In fact, standard solar technology could do the job. We are currently developing a novel process which can work with temperatures as low as 80 or 100 degrees as top temperature. We plan to build a pilot plant capturing around one tonne of CO2 per day by the end of 2010. Standard European citizen emits around seven tons of CO2 per year. So with that device, we could capture the emissions of 50 people per day. Of course, capturing carbon, even if it works, would still be an expensive option. You'd only do it if you were desperate. I think that's the number one message. We should do everything that we can to reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Let's hope to save the world, we don't have to use our last resort.